for us to gather the way we gather every month because I can tell you God has been so faithful in our monthly gathering by the grace of God we have been moving forward especially in understanding the heart of our father where we need to be and what we need to be learning on a daily basis as a student so that we can grow more into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now today we're going to start the way we normally start, and that is quoting from Matthew chapter 7, verse, 7, uh, verse 13 to 14, where the Bible says, Enter by the narrow gates, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. I want to be honest with you again, like we do on this program. The Word of God is sure forevermore. For you to be on the narrow road that leads to life, you have to be disciplined. That is after you have realized that indeed, when you have come to your senses, that indeed you are a sinner and you have yielded yourself into the hands of the Savior and He has saved you. The narrow road sometimes will be so deserted that I can tell you, God is faithful. He never leaves His children and He never forsakes them. By the way people are trying to interpret Christianity nowadays makes me wonder if very many people are, are actually treading on that narrow road. If you have found the narrow road, I pray you will know where you are and you will know indeed that you are in the right place and you will continue in your journey even by the help of the Holy Spirit. And if you are yet to find that narrow road, I pray tonight, this day, will be the day of your salvation. If you have been on the outside, just doing religion, I want to invite you this day to listen to the word of God and consider your way. And as you do so, I pray God Almighty will meet you. Amen. Now, before we go on into today's business per se, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you. Father Lord, we bless your holy name for making it possible for us to gather here again this month as your children to learn at your feet. Father, we commit everything that will be said here this day, everything that will be heard by your children, we commit everything to your hand. And we ask, Lord, that you feed us yourself, teach us your word, King of glory, and let it be glorified unto you. Let the blessings, Father, be ours from now and forevermore. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Now, today's time our sermon is titled, Is Grace to Save the Great Leveler? The Lord's Grace to Save the Great Leveler. And I want you to travel with me on a very interesting journey today because there will be twists and turns, but I pray that the Holy Spirit will open our hearts to understand this topic so that even as believers, we know our position. And also, those who are just trying to come in or those who are still on the outside gates, they will know when they see a believer, who a believer is, if they are watching or if they are listening to me. 
Our reading main text is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 20, from verse 1 to 16. You can understand that's a very long read for us. But you know what? I've decided to, to read it the way it is written. I have an abridged form of it. I've summarized it, but I, I wasn't so happy with the summary of it. I want it to come straight from the Bible the way it is written. And it shouldn't you know, take too much time for us to digest what we have here. Okay, here we go. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with laborers for a dinner, he did. He sent them into his vineyard and he went out the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you are so going to the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did, like, and did likewise. That is bringing him more laborers into his vineyard. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. Did you hear that? Beginning with the last set of laborers to the first. And when those, and when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a dinner. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a dinner. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, This last man have worked only one hour. And you made them equal to us, who have borne the body and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, did you not agree? With me for a dinner? Check what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your high evil because I'm good? So the last will be the first, and the first last. For many are called, but few chosen. That's reading from Matthew chapter 20, from verse 1 to 16. Now, I want us to understand the background of this. This is taken in chapter 20, but there is a, a reference to it when we open up to chapter 19. Series of questions were being asked our Lord Jesus Christ by the disciples, and we, it was giving them answers for them to, to comprehend. But this time around, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's trying to let people know what's obtainable in the kingdom of God. It's not what we do here on earth. What do humans do to satisfy themselves or to treat themselves one way or the other? It's not what we obtain when we're talking about the, uh, the kingdom of heaven. So the Lord was kind of Letting them understand this, the way it works. Now, the topic we have chosen today, for some, they think it's controversial. But if they open their hearts to the word of God, they will understand that the things of the kingdom of God are very deep. And the grace of God is for everyone. God in his mercy has chosen to do it that way. And let me be honest with you, it is the best way that mankind can enjoy God without complaining. But still, 
people don't understand. That believe God Almighty, as we go more into this topic today, there will be better understanding. <laughs> Note that the parable of the workers in this vineyard, we have to notice, uh, we have to note one point, like I said, that the kingdom of heaven is actually a key word. It's not just a general statement. The Lord is referring to what is obtainable in the kingdom. Now, we should know that this parable is not about God's reward system for hard work or lack of hard work. That's not what it's about in the context we are looking at it now. And this is a good reminder of the law, I'm talking about the law, that came before grace came, which proclaims works. That's what the law proclaims. The works here means placing your faith in any other thing apart from God's grace. When you place your faith upon what you can do, what you can achieve with your own hands, you're operating in the area of the works. And that doesn't take any, anybody anywhere. Okay? This is one of the things the Lord is letting them know. And also, this parable is not about people's ability to walk or their position or pedigree. That's not what we are talking about. So what is the parable particularly about? Like I said, it derives from the first verse stating or starting with, for the kingdom of God is. This is telling us what the kingdom of God is about. <laughs> now, let me read from Matthew chapter 19. There is something that will lead us back to this chapter 20 we're dealing with. From 23 to 25, then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I said, as I said to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the high of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked, this is verse 26, at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible. That is telling you nobody can save themselves. Nobody has the ability to do it. But with God, all things are possible. Amen. <laughs> so it is about the grace of God. That is what the parable is talking about. Without which no one can go to heaven in the first place. So if you will, his grace is the great leveler, regardless of your color, your creed, socioeconomic status, or whatever have you, His grace levels everything out. Amen. Now, we have support, supporting Bible texts like we normally do. We have chosen two portions of the Bible to corroborate this our topic for today. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 to 9, that's very popular. And then we have chosen Titus chapter 3, from verse 3 to 5. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of what, lest anyone should boast. Now, what is the spiritual truth about this Ephesians 2, 8 to 9? God, in his plan of salvation for mankind, confined all to disobedience. I will explain this. That is, he did not prevent them from disobedience since it is in their very nature through depravity. In the man's depraved nature could not de deliver him from the shackles of sin and death unless God intervened. This is a little bit twisty, uh, kind of naughty, but I believe the Holy Spirit will, will give us understanding. God, in his infinite knowledge, will not learn anything new. God knew that chances were there for the Jews, the Israelites, not to carry out dirtifully the assignment given to them. That is, they were the oracle 
of God. That is the carrier of the word of God. They had it. But what happened to them was very unfortunate. But still, that hasn't changed the plan of God for them. But what, what, what we are saying here is this. Because God is all-knowing, the failure of his chosen people not to continue to carry out the, the, the works of taking the gospel out to the rest of the world, God will use that failure even to bring others into relationship with himself. That's a mystery because he did not plan for them to fail. Let's continue to understand more. By no works or deeds of, of law shall anyone be made righteous. That's from Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, let's go to Titus chapter 3, from verse 3 to 5. This is the supporting Bible text we're using. This is talking about, listen, for we ourselves, this is talking to believers now, those who have given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, and don't, they know what it is to be in Christ. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. Nobody here can dispute that. Before you were born again, before you became a child of God, you know how you used to live. These are facts. But by his grace, all those things, you are moving away from them. Every day of your life, as you are being degenerated by the Spirit of the God Almighty himself. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness, listen now, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> what is the spiritual truth from this uh, Titus chapter 3, 3 to 5? Here is the truth. The word of difference between Christ's followers, I'm talking about the believers and the unbelievers, is the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in, in believers' life, in person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that was given as a gift when you received the Lord into your life. That is the world of difference that we have. That is the world of difference. Nothing else you want to talk, talk about. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit. By you choosing to go with the Savior. God's love and saving power, hmm, they are a mystery beyond human comprehension or understanding. For no man deserves being saved for the provision God made, but for the provision God made through his only son, that whoever comes through his plan of salvation may be saved. Nobody will have experienced being saved. If God had not done what he did. So for believers, we need to reflect on this all the time. So that we can live as we ought to live. Amen. Now, that said, I want us to go a bit deeper. That's why I said we're going to have some twists and turns. But I believe the Holy Spirit will bring everything together for us. We're still going to stay in the book of Romans chapter 11. 28 to 33 this time. We want to talk about how the Jewish people, the chosen people of the, of the Lord, how they misplace their priorities and how God in his mercy <laughs> had the plan to both bring in the Gentiles, that is all other people groups, apart from the Jews, and also still maintain his plan to save Israel as a nation. 
and all those people will come to him. Let me read from verse 28 to 33. So that for some people who have been battling with some, some funny ideas about the Jews being rejected, honestly, I believe they don't read the Bible. I believe that. Um, more so, I believe maybe some of them are not even children of God, so they will not have the witness within themselves. So that's those are the two things I can bring out in that area. Because that topic appears to me as the other one that people will say, if you are truly saved, they think you can lose your salvation. It's the other one, although they are not on the same pedestal. They are a bit different. Because that one is <laughs> it's even having a higher ramification, if you ask me. But you know what? When people can say that somebody can lose their faith, I mean their, their salvation, to me, it tells me that they don't understand what the plan of salvation is. And they don't even understand the person of salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. So more than likely, they might not even have him in their life. So I pray today that we open our hearts, even to the case of the Jewish people, versus all other people group that they call Gentiles. Now, reading from Romans chapter 11, 28 to 33. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. That is referring to the Gentiles. But concerning the election, they, were, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you are once disobedient to God, that is talking about the Gentiles who were far away from God, who were living in disobedience, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, that is the disobedience of the Jewish people, to continue carrying on the gospel by receiving their Messiah. The rejection of the Messiah cut off the assignment God gave them because you cannot reject the person of salvation and still be able to do what he has called you to do. That's what he did. And because God is all knowing, he had his plan. He brought in all other people group to do the work of salvation by going out to preach the gospel. I don't know how much of good work we have done with that. That's another topic, okay? But let's focus on what we have before us. Even so, this also has now been disobedient, talking about the Jews, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might add mercy on all. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. That is talking about the mystery of God. So don't bother yourself trying to, to understand that. Thing. Let's understand what the Bible is telling us. When the Bible says God has committed their all to disobedience, that means God deliberately allowed them to go their own way because God knew. At the end of the day, his counsels will be performed. He had his plan already straightened out, even in their disobedience. Amen. Now, let's just go forward and uh, talk about the spiritual understanding we can bring out. Because we've been discussing it, talking about the grace of God. If you have been with some Jewish people who are not Messianic, that is, who don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and some of them who even believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have been with them and you will let them talk to you and you let them express what they feel, some of them will be so genuine with you to talk about how all other people group, uh, people's group, like uh, they, they, they refer to our Gentiles, who also be very important in the kingdom of God. But some of them who well, I admit that is true, but yet they want they only want to look at themselves as what as you know the people of God. There's no doubt about that. Yes, starting out they had the oracle, the oracle of God, meaning they had the word of God. And I can tell you, Prophet Moses did a good job. But in passing it down, there were issues. 
up till the Lord was rejected. When the Lord was rejected, then the suspension came in. But I tell you, according to the word of God, the nation of Israel will be saved. In God's grand plan, he chose Israel for himself and loved him. And that through Israel's obedience and all disobedience, he might extend his saving love to the whole world. If you read Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, you will understand all these things. That's what is covered here. It's the plan of God to save the whole world. He said, we will bless Abraham, and through Abraham, all nations of the world will be blessed. He's not talking about, about blessings like some of you would like to see blessings. He's talking about the blessings of salvation. Amen. God is righteous. He's righteous judge. Amen. Whose strong foundation are righteousness and justice. I will not set any other standard contrary to his very essence and nature. God's grand plan was to extend salvation to all mankind through his love and master plan of mercy and his grace that cannot be hand. God's way are beyond comprehension for he is infinite while humans are finite. His ways are not our ways, the Bible says. Before we proceed, because Dealing with this background I'm giving, we are going to go into the main text for today, after we have dealt with this. I'm giving this background because the questions have always come up about the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people. The church, especially, that is talking about the Gentile people and even some of the people who are Jewish, who have now received the Lord Jesus Christ and their Lord and Savior. They are also part of the church. Though they have Jews, uh, they have a uh, uh, being Jewish as their background. So when people are talking about this, do you know the same thing that they are accusing the Jews of by saying they are trying to, to kind of have a, what's the word now? Making God to be their sole uh, God that it doesn't extend to other people's group. That they have the right and everything. Do you know the same in the same mindset? That is what the Gentiles are doing. Talking about all other people's group. You are now. When they open their mouth and they say, God has rejected Israel forever. To me, it's the same way. So this is in a way talking about human nature. So humans will be humans. So that is why the Bible encourages us. Not to walk in the flesh, so that we will not be fulfilling the lust of the flesh. We need to be spiritual children, just like we know God is spirit. If we do live in the spirit, we will understand more what God is saying to us. Amen. I have about three questions here. Three or four. I believe, yeah. Did God choose Israel to, re to reject the Savior? The answer is resounding no. God did not choose them so that they can reject him. Rejecting the Savior was Israel's failure. It had negative implications, but would not change God's plan. For God is faithful. Amen. Why then does the Bible say Israel's rejection of our Messiah is a blessing to the Gentiles. I already said that before. In the, in the plan of God, God has seen everything from A to Z. God, from the world go, knew all the scenarios. He did not plan anybody or anything for failure. But if this should happen as a result of what we eventually come up, God already knew what would be the next step of action to take. Or those actions themselves will be triggered because you are talking about God Almighty. So God had everything planned out because nobody can surprise him. And sometimes that's why we are tricked because when we see his response, we are like, how is that possible? We are talking about God Almighty. <laughs> Did God graft in the Gentiles to replace the Jews? 
the answer is no, for the Bible spells it out clearly, that the overall plan of God for Israel to be saved remains intact. Amen. Let me read Romans 11, 25 to 26. For I do not desire, brethren, this apostle Paul speaking, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. Hmm. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. <clears throat> is that difficult to understand? As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's from Romans chapter 11, 25 to 26. So if you are seeing that, check out your Bible and read for comprehension by asking the Holy Spirit to, to impact you. Then you understand clearly what the word of God is saying. Did God make a case for the Jews to feel superior to Gentiles by being referred to as the one that has the oracle of God? When you talk about the oracle of God, you are referring to the word of God. And no, make no mistakes. God gave his word starting out to the Jews. Okay? The plan of salvation started with the blessing God pronounced over Father Abraham. So who is going to dispute that? He was the first uh, Jew or Hebrew to cross over. So uh, is anybody going to dispute that? That is the truth. But that doesn't mean God was saying they were or they are superior in any sense. It is a responsibility. It is a responsibility. And unfortunately, even those responsibilities along the line were not fulfilled. But God is still very faithful. <laughs> so, did God, did God make a case that the Jews would be superior? No, the Jews were saddled with responsibilities to convey the word of God and preach it to the whole world. They could not do a good job of preaching the word as assigned to them because they rejected their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and they became cursed for it. But the Bible says the curse will be lifted and the whole nation of Israel will be saved. That is the word of God. As the church, that is Gentiles plus Jews who have received the Lord Jesus Christ into their lives, have they been able to make a case for their claim that God rejected Israel? No, they have not been able to make a case. It's just the, the way humans like to just peddle things that are not based on facts because the word of God does not say that. It's not according to the word of God. All right, before we delve into an in-depth, you know, exposition into today's main text, I want us to do some justice in the area of defining uh, about two or three uh, words in the word of God. And I'm going to start with the word love. What is God's love? God's love is his divine compassion that is beyond human comprehension. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love, his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God didn't start loving us because <laughs> we chose to follow him. No. He loved us when we were sinners. Talking to believers. So those who are still outside the gate, as they are, he loves them to come into relationship with them. That's his plan. The Bible says, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. According to the Bible, what is mercy? Mercy is God not giving unto man what he deserves in terms of punishment for his sin's problem. Mercy is God not giving Unto man, what he deserves in terms of punishment for his sin problems. If not for the mercy of God, you and I will not be here today. Just believe it. The Bible says, Titus 3.5. We read part of it the other time. 
Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is grace according to the Bible? Grace is God giving to man what he does not deserve in terms of blessings. Man did not deserve the blessings bestowed upon him. That's how you know the kind of God we are talking about. Genesis 12, 3, the Bible says, talking to, God talking to Father Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God had a plan of blessings for man that was wallowing in his sin. The blessing was to save him and deliver him from his sin, from the power of sin and death. And he did that once and for all by sending his only begotten son. And he says, whosoever shall believe in him shall follow that path, his plan of salvation. Such a person will be saved. That's what we are talking about. That's the word of God. Now, let's have some in-depth look into that parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Let's have some in-depth in look. Uh, I'm going to talk about the landowner who is, of course, the image of God Almighty himself. And we know the laborers, we can look at them as just human beings on general level. The landowner being gracious, invited in, <coughs> invited all to enter into fruitful work, regardless of their status. Their status we are talking about here is regardless of the time they made themselves available. He opened the door for them to go into the vineyard and be productive. The landowner did not take into consideration the hours worked, or the conditions under which the work was performed, or the order in which the laborers were hired, for he gave them all equal wages. This is talking about his grace for all to come in. So we are not talking about being hard work, uh, uh, hard working here. We are talking about the grace of the landowner to bring people in to work in the vineyard. Now, that's why we say the reward system is different. The Lord knows about the reward system. He knows how he's going to reward each and every one of us. But he's not talking about the reward system now. He's talking about his grace to open the door for her to come in. Amen. The last on that decision to give equal wages was his prerogative as he had his wealth and had the right to disperse as he was pleased. Hello? I don't think anybody should just put that with the landowner, okay? The landowner made it expressly clear that he reserved the right to himself who he will consider first based on his own judgment and not what the laborers thought. When he said the last set of the laborers should be given their wages first and the first set will be given later. That is talking about the Gentiles that are grafted in later, they will see the Savior first. And talking about this, the Holy Spirit will be saved later. But for information, we will all be saved. Amen. That is the word of God. We have talked about it, and we'll go deeper. Because we want this to sink in into each and every one of us. Especially we believers. We need to understand the grace God has bestowed upon us. And the same grace is awaiting those who will come in. And it's actually beckoning to them. Coming, coming, coming. <laughs> the Londoner was the image of the gracious God who opened equal access. We said that the other time. Salvation cannot be hand. It is a gift given freely when we confess Jesus as our Lord. Neither is it of works, lest anyone should boast. <laughs> we are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We have said all this. It's, it's a form of recap for us to refresh our mind about what we are learning today. The saving grace of Jesus Christ, having been extended to the Jew first, was also made available to others because it is the same law over all that is reached to us all that will call upon his name. Romans 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The Greek is referring to all other people's group, okay? God's original and only plan was for all mankind to be saved, period. Read Genesis chapter 12 verse 3. It's there. We read it the other time. Now, <laughs> I'm saying this because it's very important. You see, those people who, have, who regard themselves as, as being important, maybe because they think they are, they are more educated than others or they are more exposed than others or they are wealthier than others. <clears throat> if they don't see the plan of salvation for what it is, they will end up in hell, unfortunately. That's not our prayer. In fact, for, not, for that not to happen is why I'm standing here today. God is infinitely wise. The Bible says, in his wisdom, he has chosen what you people have called foolishness. That through that foolishness you have defined, people who believe in will be saved. Can't you see the God we are talking about? It's not our mate. <laughs> now, let me talk of some personal applications to believers because this is very important. Because I've had so many believers who will just uh, want to try to avoid that area. <laughs> this lesson is beyond talking about uh, one nation of Israel and all other nations. Actually, we should examine ourselves. Each time we feel that we go out to preach to people. Maybe we've been in the Lord for several years, being faithful. And then somebody on his deathbed, on his deathbed, by the grace of God, we're able to lead such a person to Christ. And that person, you know, because that person genuinely confessed the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that person will, will be in heaven with you. Do you know sometimes some believers will ask the question, so I've been here doing this work all these years. And this person, like the thief on the, on the cross with the Lord Jesus Christ. But you have to know, God is a faithful God. The privilege for you to even serve him, you need to recognize that. Do you know, going back to that uh, parable, that's one thing that the example of those laborers that were hired earlier on, didn't really realize. They didn't realize the privilege to work with the Savior. Looking at that example. Because in addition to that, the Bible says, God is not unjust. That he will forget our labor of love. All the ministering you have done, God will reward you. <laughs> he has his reward system intact. For everyone. And that is not saying that those people that are being saved may be close, very close to the time they will go to meet with the Lord. That doesn't mean they will not have reward. That's not what I'm saying. Because it depends on the situation of individuals. God knows. <laughs> so I don't dwell in areas like, areas like that. I'm just explaining that if you have been serving faithfully, I don't want you to think that God is unjust. For God is not unjust. Amen. <laughs> he is not unjust. He will do that which he alone can do. And everyone will know that he did. The Lord Jesus is Lord. Even to the glory of God the Father. Alright. Admonition to believers. This we do to encourage ourselves. To know that he did. We have been called into service. We are not to go about clothing because we are Christians. We are not to go about feeling more important when we are supposed to be feeling pressured to go and do what he has called us to do. That's what I see most of the times. Reading from Romans chapter 9, from verse 14 to 16. 
Apostle Paul, by the Spirit of God, was saying to the Christians in Rome, What shall we say then? Is there a righteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him who wills, not of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Amen. So brethren, <laughs> as recipients of his mercy, let's go and live for him. As recipients of his grace, let's go and live for him. By saying this with Paul the Apostle. I'll quote from uh, Galatians chapter 2, 19 to 20. Let's say this with Paul the Apostle. For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. Let's say that together. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer hard who live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If you have said that as a child of God, please let's go and do what you has called us to do. Amen. Now to unbelievers. I know, by the grace of God, I've made this sound so, so clear to the best of my understanding. So that will have opened up your heart to know that the hands of God are hoping to receive you. So no hindrance, no complaint, because the plane is level. God has opened it up for all to come. Decision is yours. And I can tell you, according to the word of God, life as it were has been designed purposely to fail everybody who refuses the love of God to be saved. That's the truth, according to the word of God. If you die without the Lord Jesus Christ, that means your name is not written in the Lamb Book of Life. Also, your name has been removed from the book of the living, that is, the original book of life for everyone born alive. That means you never made life or had any prosperity regardless of your status while on earth. You'll be sent to hell, a bunny detention cell, <laughs> before you are sentenced to eternal damnation in the lake of fire at the great white tomb judgment. That is not my prayer for you. And that is, in fact, not God's plan for you. Amen. God did not plan this for anybody. It was designed for Satan and his demons. Everyone makes decision to go there or not. I hope you will make that decision not to go there today. The choice is yours. And I pray you will choose wisely. I'm going to read from Romans chapter 10, from 9 to 13. It's a kind of a summary for our today's topic. That the Lord, through his mercy and grace, has opened the door for her to come. We call this the era of grace. And I pray everyone under the sound of my voice today will open their hearts to understand. If you are yet to be a child of God, make today the day of your salvation. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with your mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That's the word of God. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. That is telling you, God does not discriminate about who will come to him. Regardless of whatever you have been taught before, God is open to her to come. Amen. For the same Lord over her is rich to all who will call upon his name. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. 
She does the word of God to you. And I pray that you take the opportunity today because tomorrow might be too late to open your hearts and come to your Savior. A link to a page on our website that we have especially prepared for you, for your convenience, will be showing at this time. Please go to that page. We have done this in such a way that it's so simple for you to see. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and make that decision today. For we believe it will be the best decision of your life that you have ever made. When you realize the newness of life that you have, you will know, indeed, this day has been an appointed day for you. Amen. Shall we pray even as we close? Dear Lord Jesus, we want to say thank you. We thank you for your love. <laughs> We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you for your grace to save. That no one has been discriminated against. You have opened the door unto all to come in. Thank you for those of us that you have received now. And thank you for those who are coming in. Father, I pray that all those who have watched this message or who have listened to it, I pray, Lord, that you allow the world they have had or or, or, or or received today to mix to mix with faith in their hearts that they will consider making the right decision by the light that you have shown them today. Let it be, Lord, that all these ones will become your children indeed in the mighty name of Jesus, that they will know your grace that you have released over all is sufficient for everyone to take advantage of you and to live for you and to live with you eternally. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. And until next time, I will see you again on this program. Remain blessed. <laughs>